All right. Oh, I love that. That's like a that's like this battle cry of the retarded. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Get ready for it. Sweet. <laughs> All right. So, um, I'm, you know, there's a lot of the stuff going on the coronavirus, and you know, you watch it from a distance. And when it all first started, I told everybody, you know, we need to be grateful we're in our homes. We need to be grateful we've been told to go to those sacred spaces where we can sit down and, and get, our, get our thoughts around what's going on and be, find out who we're with, the people we love, and all of that stuff. <laughs> it was good advice for the time. Because people were confused. People were scared. And Justin said it best. He's, you know, scary is a word for little kids. And he's right. We're supposed to be grown men and women. The... Uh, and I keep watching all of this happen in these daily press conferences and all of this information overload, this bombarding the public and people and people leaving in fear because of some kind of nonsense of uh, what they heard is going on. I just got a real ish, real wake up call as to what we've really sacrificed with, um, with um, this past weekend. So my, my sister and her husband have been married for a long time. I know that family and everybody, they all know me. You know I mean? How could you not? <laughs> but John had a little brother named Jeff. So Jeff is 41 years old and he came home and, um, and he spent some time with his wife and he died right in that special moment. Ambulance came. He was non-responsive, no pulse, loaded him up in the ambulance. And then they uh, took him to the hospital. Well, you know, nobody can, nobody can go to the hospital with him because of coronavirus. You can't ride an ambulance, it's coronavirus. So 5.30 shows, you know, rolls around. 10 o'clock that evening, the hospital finally comes on and tells the family, yes, he was dead on arrival. Five hours later. I got to thinking about that. If we're building these communities, and then all of a sudden the government's sitting here telling us, hey, uh, you can't go hold the hand of the one you love as they're dying because the government says it's for the public safety and coronavirus. I think I'm at the point now of calling horseshit on that. You see, that's, if people are scared about the crumb, well, you might infect others. Stay at home. Don't eat that cheeseburger. Don't uh, don't drive that car down the road. You're still at risk. They make you wear a seatbelt one day, and you can work, drive a motorcycle without a helmet the next. I think, it, and so I thought about that all weekend, and I asked my sister today. I'm like, when's the uh, when's the funeral? Oh, well, they're not going to have one because we're not allowed to. What? Okay, so now all of a sudden, you can't go to the hospital to hold the hand of someone that's dying. So there are thousands of people in the hospital right now dying alone while their loved ones sit at the house because the government said, well, you don't, need, you don't have the right to assemble anymore because of uh, coronavirus. Suspended the right to assemble. Now, when it's time to bury them, well, no, you still don't have the right to assemble because the government says so because we don't want to... Uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to spread the coronavirus. So you can't have a funeral either. Excuse me, a right to assemble is a right, not a privilege from this government. I don't know how it is in South Africa. You're probably going to have to fight for that shit. I'm just telling you right now, Chris. When are we going to stop saying, uh, hey, uh, you don't get to tell me I can't hold the hand of someone I love because you motherfuckers can't figure it out. Oh, but Brian, you might infect other people. Yeah. Does anyone really think that I care if it's my little girl in that hospital? Does anyone think I care if it's my mother or my father or stepfather in that hospital? Stay home, stay away from me. I don't mind if you stay away from me at all. <laughs> so we got some things happening here on a much larger scale than I think we understand. It started all off, we go home. We sit at the house with our loved ones. We take and we evaluate things that are going on. We sit around those sacred vase and all of these things that are special to us. 
and we begin to take stock of what's really going on in our lives and we figure out who we're next to and we figure out that the people we're with are the people we love. And then, uh, and then they get sick and then they say, no, you can't express that. You don't want to have that right. I wonder if they understand that that right to assemble, that right to a freedom of association is the backbone of so much of what America and most other free countries stand for. And we let it slide right under the rug. We said, we're scared, we'll go ahead and give that to you. I could be wrong. Is here doctors and nurses can go in there day in and day out because well they have the protective gear and the training. I can wear that protective gear too. I got some training of my own. Now how what's it going to look like when somebody tells me I can't see my daughter? Does anyone think that I'm not going to end up in jail? Or if I'm in a hospital, does anyone think they're going to stop my mom from coming in there? Good luck. How are we supposed to look at that from our perspective, from an also true perspective, from a pagan perspective? I don't care if you're Greek. I don't care if it's Rodnovery. I don't care if it's Kematism. We build all these little tribes, and then all of a sudden, no, that doesn't, it's not qualified. It's not important enough. We don't value your religious tradition because other people are scared. What is going on here? What's happening with all of this stuff? We sat down and collected our thoughts and realized we got some shit worth fighting for still. And 90% of it revolves around the love we have of our families. We found a place where we could begin to reach out, reconnect, rebuild, and really begin to understand what it means to love someone. And then we're told by our government, no, you can't do that. I don't know about you all, but some of the most atrocious things that have ever happened in human history have come from denying people the ability to love somebody. Even all the way back to the Trojan War. No, you don't get to love Helen. She belongs to me. <laughs> Think how that went. Poor Ulysses got lost for 10 fucking years. Huh. Kings and queens have gone to war over that kind of stuff. How long are we going to let that stand? Well, Brian, what are you going to do? You're going to get arrested. You're going to go to jail. <clears throat> I've heard that some church in California, they put up a, a protest against it, filed it against the Supreme Court. Court wouldn't even hear it. Didn't even want to hear it. So now the courts ain't even on our side. Ooh. Now all of a sudden, the ideas of justice that are such a powerful... Look, man, justice is one of the cornerstones of everything we believe in, especially with our ancient societies. Look at how it's laid out in the Lord. I've said it once and I'm going to say it again. Odin and Frigg, these two power couple, this, uh, these very much powerful representations of what Asgard is all about. Had a son, Balder. Balder with Nana had a son, Forseti. Forseti is the one who gave the most equitable judgments and settled, put to sleep all suits. Balder's the one whose runes and whose few, fewest baneful runes existed. And those priests of the ancient Teutonic priesthood of all of these different cultures, and I don't mean just one, I mean several of them, they derived their authority to enact discipline in the community, especially against cowardice from Forseti. He is the one that built a cornerstone that allowed free men to thrive. And now all of a sudden we're giving that up because of a disease. Some people are going to die. Three or 4% of 370 million will overwhelm our system. We ain't anywhere close to that. Oh, well, the social distancing works. How do we know? I'm still at work every day. I work around men all day long. I'm in and out of stores all day long. I'm at work with, I don't know how many different people. I don't know where they've been. If they've all been around six other people, I don't know where them six other people are. Or it goes on and on and on. I ain't been sick. Nobody I know has been sick. Fortunately, I have a friend who is a nurse. She's a brave woman. She's a real brave woman. Her, father, her husband is a, is a chief of the police department, local community. So I've got, I got this power couple. I'm looking at them, too. She's going in there every day. 
every day. Some nurses are just not making it. They're not doing it. So you have construction workers, you have the clerks in all of these stores, you have doctors and nurses and specialists and truck drivers, and you have just about quarter of America working, keeping it skimping by. I just got real concerns about what this is going to now. In the beginning, I hope for the best, but now I'm looking at it and there's some things that are going on that are not going to end well. I saw a, 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 I saw a busload of cops pull a dude off the subway the other day. Why didn't those people help that man? Because he wasn't wearing a mask. Because he wasn't wearing a mask. We got a dress code now too. We have some things as a nation, as a people, as many nations, we need to figure out just how much of this shit are we going to let slide because we're scared. There's a certain segment of the population that does need to be protected. They need to stay inside. We'll bring you food. We'll take care of you. We'll make sure you're taken care of. But every joker in the world, lock it down for 14 days. Nobody does nothing. You can't get out of your house. We'll stop this virus in the track. How do you know? All it takes is one infected person. You can lock it down for a month. Some dickhead over here has been wandering around in an alley, sicker than a dog for two weeks. Oh, everything's great. Social distancing is over. He's going to cough on four people, and here we go again. So you're telling me that this, we know this is going to work? The virus will run its course. Honey, baby, there's some bigger issues going on here than, than we're being told because it's not adding up. We're not, it's not, everything that's going on, it's not adding up. There's too much uncertainty. We know China lied through their damn teeth about all of it. Personally, for me, I'd nuke them before breakfast because as far as I'm concerned, it was an act of warfare. This tension is building up. These people sitting at home, not all of them like each other either. We miss our families. We miss the people that we work with. We're sitting here in our homes. Are we waiting to die? When will that begin to take shape? When will that thought process anchor itself into the mindset of mentally ill individuals? Because it's coming. Some lunatic. I've heard it before. You could build a utopia. You could build the perfect society. And somewhere there would be one dumbass who decides I need to prove who I am and I'm going to go out with a bang. All of it, give it time, folks. It's coming. Somebody's going to snap. How do we fight that? How do we step out of that mindset? Because I promise you, that's a rabbit hole that will eat even my lunch. I can get wrapped up like that all day long. <coughs> it's ridiculous, this thought process of, but I'll stay in my home and I'll be safe. From what? Walking down the street, you can't walk out your front door without taking a risk. Seatbelt laws infuriate me. You know, it ain't the other guy. You, you're responsible for your safety. When we start talking about responsibility with regards to who we are, we're responsible for our personal growth, and we're responsible to grow up, and we're responsible to pay our bills. But when it comes to our safety, we're not responsible for it? Horseshit. Who said that? What kind of bill of goods have we been sold under the auspices of public safety and fines. It's nonsense. It's, and it's going to cause a problem. <clears throat> the first people to speak out about it, the first people to stand up against it, are going to be vilified. Those are the people that are going to be shed, pushed to the corners of society. It ain't going to be Antifa. They're not going to stand up against it. They're happy as a pigs in shit with their communist ideas. They get free money all day long and ain't got to do nothing but sit around, get high and bitch about the professor. Who's going to start complaining about it first? Because that's the segment of society that's going to be relegated to the corner, the backwoods, the negative, who they're bad people, and the, their, their histories will be splayed across social media and the news, and everybody will believe it. <clears throat> and here we all are 
sitting here talking about pagan ideas and ancient pagan traditions and ancient gods of war and raising hell and kicking ass. <laughs> saying, hey, fellas, we're about done with this nonsense. Now what are you going to do? Now how are we going to do it? We're going to run up there like John Wayne? And we're going to stand up and be intelligent about it. See, because I don't see any senators or congressmen or any of these other bastards in Washington, I don't see them getting sick. I see them pushing through agendas while nobody's paying attention. I see people, uh, I see some people dying. I see some aspects of our communities not dealing with it. But we are, they are toying with some things that this country was founded upon for public safety and expecting our obedience or we'll, you'll have to pay a fine. Guys, I'm telling you right now, that kind of nonsense ain't gonna last much longer. There's a whole host of veterans that fought and watched their friends die under the ideas of personal freedom. There's a bunch of men enjoying a new kind of freedom in their world and all of a sudden they're being told, no, you can probably, you'll be all right. You can go right back to the way you've been living right back into that cell. Oh, now that's being taken from you too. We have all these women that are spending their time with their husbands and um, there's no forms of communication. All of a sudden we don't know how to talk to each other. If we're not talking about our day's work or what we did or who we had to deal with or how things are going, what are we talking about? We don't know anymore. I don't know how to communicate with you. I don't understand what's going on. So things, we're watching shit die on the vine, people. Our economy, small businesses. I'm tempted to believe that we're not going to let all this run through because, well, the insurance companies couldn't pay all the medical claims because when that joker dies in the hospital, he ain't paying that bill. The hospital will write it off on his taxes. The government will give him a credit. And the insurance company will skate off with it. But if they get better... You got a $39,000, $50,000 hospital bill. All of a sudden, you're on the hook for a lot of money. Who's going to pay that? Well, I got insurance. You ain't got that kind of insurance, I promise. <laughs> Even if all the beds in New York City are full, think about the amount of money involved in paying all of that overtime, all that equipment, all that medicine, all that electricity. It's huge, huge, huge expense and our government's giving money away to prop up banks. Our money's giving, our government's getting everybody, well, here's $1,200. It's like a rich man, and you do some work for a rich dude, you know, and the bastard kind of opens his wallet and see a bunch of hundreds, and he like kind of scrapes, oh, yeah, okay, here's 20. <laughs> it just burns my ass. There's a few things in the world that make me madder than that. <clears throat> All right, anyway, enough of that bullshit. It gets me fired up, man. I don't, I can't stand it. I'm just, I'm offended, I'm astonished, I'm astounded. We have all of this talk about pride and honor and integrity and we're free men. All of a sudden we ain't fucking free men because of a disease in our government. The people we elected to serve us are sitting up there saying, well, we're doing it for the public safety. Stick that public safety up your ass. I have a life to live and I didn't come into this world simply because, well, I'm not really sure what to do, so we'll just send everybody to their room. You ain't my daddy. You ain't the damn warden. You ain't the first sergeant. God dang, it burns me up, man. It's beginning to get under my skin. It is beginning to get under my skin. And people just don't seem to care. Oh, well, it's a real deal. I lost a friend. Yeah, you probably did. I probably will, too. Hell, I lost one the other day, didn't I? That's how life goes. And people are just setting it down. Yeah, you're right, Eris. People are encouraging other people to call the police because, well, they saw something that didn't quite sit right. Um, stores are closed. It used to be a 24-hour world. You could go buy anything you wanted to any time of the day. Now, all of a sudden, everything's closed at 9 o'clock. What do you want to do, Marie? You going to lead the way? Have you built a tribe that will back you up when a cop grabs a hold of your neck? Because that's what you're look, talking about doing. That's exactly what you're talking about doing. You want to start talking about civil disobedience and, and all that stuff, 
we're going to find out just exactly how powerful these bonds of tribe that we see, think we've cultivated are going to be. Have you, can you make a phone call when the cops around your house and they surround the cops? There's some militias that can. Have you done it on a good solid spiritual foundation on loving each other like brothers, like men taking care of their kids, taking care of their wives, standing up for each other when somebody's talking bad about them. Have you done any of that? Because that's because you're asking them to give their life. See, when we start talking about building a tribe in a community, it's got to go something way beyond just, hey, I don't like that group over there or that group over there. It's got to be because I give a shit about you. It's good to have you in my life. Let's build something good together. That's what we need more of. Because I promise you right now at this level of the things that we've cultivated to call it paganism or heathenism or also true or any of that other stuff, we're not that strong. We are not the Mormon church. You, can't, you ain't going to screw with the Mormons. I promise you that. I promise you that. When they decide to stop playing the game, there's nobody going to be able to do a damn thing about it. Take my word for it. I got it. Stephanie's in-laws are all Osmonds. I'm telling you right now, don't play the game with them. When they decide to stop that social distancing, if they want to have church in Utah, they're going to have church in Utah and ain't nobody going to stop it. Meanwhile, the rest of the country has just decided I'd rather it be convenient. I don't really want to have to mess with that. You can go, government can go ahead and take care of that so I can make some money and pay my bills and um, watch Netflix and chill. So we got some real decisions to do here. We got some real thinking to do here. It'd be real easy to get fired up all day long about some third position or some form of government or somebody that wrote something or all kinds of stuff in the past. But buddy, we're right here right now. We got to start taking a real strong look at our associations and why we're associating with them. Why am, why are these people, why are we talking to each other? What are we cultivating with this? What do we do? Yep. This is what I'm talking about. We build each other up and then we start standing beside each other not taking cheap shots at people because you want to stab them in the back. So you might leapfrog in front of him on some made up political ideology within some community. Let me tell somebody's done that to me. Oh, well I'll stab Brian Wilton in the back and I'll say something bad about him. Then I'll be a little bit more important than everybody else. Going, I've been doing this since 2013. I'm still here. Huh? And probably, and still number one, don't ever do anything. All I've ever said is I want to see the people that I work with go beyond where I am. Go out there and be successful as you can be. If you have somebody next to you that believes in you like that, if you have somebody next to you that follows these principles, these nine noble virtues, and these ideas we hold holy and also true, that reverence with these gods, that stand behind, beside you saying, you know what, I believe in you, <clears throat> go give it a shot, I'm going to support you 110%. I don't know if you're right or not, doesn't matter. You're my friend, I got you. Those are the kind of bonds we ought to be building with each other. Not based on whether or not I've read David Lane's 88 precepts or understand some of the social justice warrior concepts. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is building a bond with either one of them that allows them to go become something more on ideas of personal self-love, personal self-worth, kind of ideas that will say, hey, he's in trouble. I don't really care what it is. I'm going to stand beside him. And that's where we're failing. It's real easy to stand beside somebody that's angry, that's righteously indignant, that can identify the ills of society. It's a much different thing to put everything at risk because you love someone. And that's the whole point of all of this. When we say, I said, we got home, we figured out our ways, we found out who we were surrounded by. Who are the people that I love? Who are the people that want to be beside me? Well, those people that I love that are beside me, I know they got my back. And if I'm in a position, I know with a phone call, there's going to be a bunch of them standing right next to me. That's what we need to be cultivating. And when somebody says something about them, I got to do my best to be straightforward about it. I stand up and try to do the right thing. I got to do it because I love them. We're not seeing that's the hard part of all of it, isn't it? We're not in jail and we're not on the battlefield. We're not being forced to cultivate those bonds because of outside pressures or clearly delineated lines of who is against us and who is with us. 
Now we're out here trying to build it based on faith and ancient ideas, and we're trying to recreate the wheel, and we keep picking the low-hanging fruit. Let's be that upright, standing, and worthy man or woman who people say, you know what, I want some of what that guy has working in my life. I'm going to associate with him because I see him going places. And the reciprocating aspect of that, when you do an oath with someone, it's a two-way street. They might owe themselves to you, but you accept some responsibilities too. And part of that responsibility is doing your level best to make sure that person enjoys the best life they can. And sometimes it means calling them on their shit. Can't do that. Don't be whooping your wife's ass. Stop beating your damn kids. Quit doing drugs. Dumb things. You gotta love people. You look at all of our lore, you look at all of these things that we're talking about, these men fighting these battles, they're fighting because how many times have you read in the lore where the women turned to the tide of battle because there was wailing and they bared their breasts and every man knew if I lose, those women are gonna suffer. That woman that I love is gonna suffer. There's something worth fighting for right there. There's something worth giving 110% right there because that's a person that I love and I care about. When are we gonna build those kinds of bonds? Because that's where it's, if we don't, a lot of this is going to die in the backyards with the people that started it. Because everybody else was more interested in just being right. And we need to inspire each other and push each other to be better each and every day. You're damn right, Sam Ramsey. That's exactly what we're here to do. Because if you're doing that, I'm telling you right now, you don't have time to sit on your laurels. You're going to have to be honest with yourself. I don't always like what I see when I take a look at myself. That means I got work to do. That means I got to live up to something. That means there's an obligation I got to meet to somebody that I care about. I got to do better each and every single day. To me, when I look at also true, there's a lot of wonderful things about it. I could be a Viking. I could get covered in tattoos. I could write another book. I could do all these wonderful things. I could live in a fantasy world, live a life of expected phenomena, waiting to see a raven or a bear or something to justify my radical departure from the norms of society. And the longer I stay in it, the longer I work with other people, the more I begin to believe in all of this, the more I'm so firmly convinced that the foundation of all of it has to reside within my ability to love someone else. And Ram Dass said it best. He said, the best thing we can do in life is escort those souls that are next to us as lovingly as possible to greet the sun facing goddess at the doorway of death. What greater benefit could you have in this world than to do your level best to love someone along their path in life? Sometimes that might mean standing up and whooping ass. Just the way it is, folks. So when we start practicing this pagan faith, and we start talking about building a community, let's start talking about building a community because we give a shit about each other. And we've got to figure out what that means. There's so much baggage that goes with that term love, it's, un, it's unreal how badly it's been fucked up. Oh, well, there's a cage, or oh my gosh, that guy, you just kind of, you just kind of, it's too much. <laughs> We've lost the ability to make a sound, reasonable decisions about affairs of the heart because. Every one of us has had it ripped out of our chest, stomped on, spit, chewed up, ate. Every one of us has the scars of some kind of codependent, narcissistic fucking nightmare we've had to live through. Every one of us come up, might have not been the best home life we ever had. And all of a sudden, we got thrown a lifeline in the world by these gods we showed up here. A group of gods that were so radically different from each other, you can't begin to imagine it. And yet we call them all together the Aesir and the Aesir, they ain't all from the same place. They don't all stand for the same thing. They all have a unique and individual role to make a more powerful community. And every one of them will go to task for the person next to them. You see it at Eager's Feast. You have one negative idea in there, humanizing and denigrating each one of these gods and goddesses, just stirring the pot. And every time it happens, Another one stands up and says, no, you can't say that about him. Doesn't matter if they have faults of their own. They're all quickly pointed out. But in that moment, there's someone standing up saying, that's someone I care about. You don't get to say that about him. We got to start doing some of that. Because if we ever expect to feast or to dive or to thrive in this 
radical new ocean of spirituality we stand upon the shores of, it's going to mean caring for each other. Right now, that's under threat in the most obscene of ways because of cowardice. Think about that. Our ability to meet with each other, to raise a horn, to give each other a hug even. Good night. I can't even give a hug to a good friend or someone I love because I see him on the street. Oh, we might get the corona. Mm, because of cowardice. Think about that where that stands with regards to Ossetry. Those were the men that were ostracized, sacrificed, run out of the community and outlawed. Cowardice in battle? Well, we're in battle right now. The biggest act of rebellion we can do is love each other and go see them and be brave. And you might get sick. And you might not get sick. Because right now, there's some evidence that there's whole segments of this society that are asymptomatic. They don't carry nothing. Hell, we could have all already had it. But a lot of people in January and February sicker than dogs and could not shake it. That's exactly right, Joe. We can't stand together in times of peace. How can we possibly stand together in times of crisis? Well, we're in that time of crisis. And we had a hell of a time trying to stick together in a time of peace. Well, I don't like that person over there. I'm not going to be a part of all this. And I, though they said the wrong thing, I'm not going to be a part of all this. And, well, I, I'm not real sure the AFA may have said something bad. I'm, I'm but I'm not going to be a part of all this. Well, what are you going to be a part of? You're going to form your own group? Form it. Form it in bonds of love. Build it with, with just, I mean, just bind it together because you give a shit about each other. That's the real lesson of everything that shows up in, in all of the lore. Look at all of the wonderful love stories that are contained in our lore. You've got Frey and Gerder, you have Odin and Frigg, you have Freya and Oder, you have, you have Sigurd and Brunhild, you have, you have uh, Zvibdag and Mingloth, all of these wonderful things. We've got to figure that out. Sometimes that might mean, as a man, that I can't escape the possibility that I might get my heart broken by putting an unreasonable set of demands, ideas, or tasks, or conditions upon some woman. See, because we're not going to find a virgin in this day and age. But what we will find, if we're man enough to do it, are new aspects of the beauty of a woman's heart. Ooh, there's an idea we got to think about. We do it right. We might find something very special she ain't never shown to anyone because the walls are high and they're pretty thick and a lot of people. There's a real challenge in there. That's kind of off the subject, but, but not really. We got to start showing some courage about all of these things we're doing. Sam Ramsey, I've seen so much selfishness in these times that people forget about the ones that look how they need that extra push. Odin taught us to sacrifice. Come on now, quit jumping on me. It's moving too fast. Can't keep up with it. But you're right, Chris. Good times make weak men. Weak men make tough times. Tough times make strong men. And strong men make good times. And we're in that tough time and we need strong men. And that means being able to stand up like a man and, and uh, understand I got work to do on myself if I ever expect to have somebody at my side that has my back 110%. That's a real bitter pill to swallow. Set of tools I was given ain't enough. Be that as it may. <laughs> we are in that tough time. And we are as heathens overall. And not everybody that's listening to this is going to be Austrian. There's going to be a lot of people that are heathens. There's going to be some witches. There's going to be all kinds of people listening to this. And every one of them is paying attention to that idea. We need the intelligence, the thoughtfulness, the caring for each other to build those strengths so we understand what we're fighting for. Because right now, you couldn't fire enough people up and say, um, well, I'm scared. But if you had 110 people standing beside you that said, hey, that person there is going to go get to see their child as they die. That person's going to go get to see their child as they die. And that's what we need to look at cult cultivating. Courage, community, commitment to each other. 
not based on whether or not we believe in some political idea, but because we love each other. And it's such a radical concept for, for heathenry or also true because we're all manly men doing manly things. I know I'm big guilty as hell of it. Still am. I love it. I think it's funny as shit. But at some point, we got to have the courage to, to love each other. You know, and that's a, that's a scary thing. And like Jim said, like I said at the beginning, scary is a word for little kids. You know, you're right, Aaron. You know, that protest is important. Who knows what is probably all go to jail, but you need to understand, where's that at? Some, there's a protest going on about people saying, well, you can't associate with each other. It's going to get worse. Those will continue unless it's brutally crushed. But we can't just let everything we love die on the vine, guys. We can't just let this freedom and our ability to associate with each other and raise a horn and sit around a fire and look in someone else's eyes and see that kind of magic in their eyes <clears throat> about the same thing you believe in. We can't let it die on the vine. And we're, I think, kind of at that point where that's at risk. I heard Jack Donovan say the other day, and he had made a little Start the World video, and I don't really care what you think about Jack. What he says still is pertinent. He was talking about, you know, people wanting to change the world. He said, you're probably not going to do that. And he's not wrong. I say it all the time, and it pisses me off because I'd like to change the world. He said, what you can change is your own world. He said, what you have to understand is that life without a poetic framework is just math. So fucking pissed he said it, and I didn't because I think it's literary gold. Life without a poetic framework is just math. Part of that poetic framework is taking care of each other and loving each other and, and having what it takes to stand up against people that would deny us our right, our ability to express that. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights, I can't believe we sacrificed them because people were scared of getting sick. And we did it. Who's to say that they're not going to just think, well, they really don't need them to begin with. Look how well everything is working. And I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that world at all. So when you get, get to thinking about it, and you're sitting in your sacred space, start figuring out who you love. My kids, my gosh, my grandkids. What world do I want to leave them? What image do I, I want them to have of grandpa? One of them little fuckers better take my books to the moon or Mars or wherever they go. That's all I can say. So I got to be because <laughs> that's what I expect. I expect to be the first Ethan author in space. <laughs> but we ain't going to get there if we're sitting around hiding in our houses. And uh, Anyway, I think I got all, that's all I've got to say about that. That's just been on my mind. It really broke my heart that that boy that I've known for so long died of a heart attack at home. The ambulance came and picked him up. Nobody could ride with him. Nobody that loved him could go with him. And then he went to that hospital. And five hours later, they called the family to say, well, he was dead on arrival. That's what we get for relying on other people to take care of the things we need to take care of. So I just don't, uh, I don't want to see the people that I love go through that kind of shit. And I'm kind of at the point now where I think I'd be ready to fight for that. I don't want to see the people that I love have to go through that kind of pain and that kind of aloneness and that kind of uncertainty waiting on somebody to say, well, he's already gone. Instead of being there to hold their hand where they pass. I was there with my grandmother and my grandfather, I was there when they passed. I remember holding their hand one minute they're there and the next minute they're not. What a fucking shame. What an indecency against basic human principles that we would be denied that and we would so willingly do it. 
are we so wrapped up in our own selfish ideas that we want to avoid the painful deal of holding someone's hand that's dying? Are we that scared of it? We need to answer some questions. We need to answer some real hard questions about ourselves. Because like I say, I don't want to see anyone I care about have to go through that ever again. And I'm kind of at that point where I'm willing to do quite a bit to make sure it doesn't. Anybody got any questions? Let me go through these comments here. There's a, there's a of them. I got one a little bit off topic. Uh, last time, uh, last video, uh, you had gotten a call about your boy. Oh, Jeff, yeah. How's he doing? He's all right. I think it was just the flu. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear he's doing all right. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, – Yeah, it's uh, he just he, I think he just had the flu, and uh, he's I think he's going to work with me next week. I say everybody else is working. We're all out here working. We're all out here exposed. Hell, I was working at Stillwater Regional Medical Center last week. Everybody's out there wearing a mask, and I refuse to wear that stupid thing. See, this is the part that I don't get. Hey, there's a virus coming. Wash your hands. Wait a minute. I already washed my hands. <laughs> so all of a sudden, washing your hands becomes a superhuman act. What? I don't get all I get, that. Hey, Brian, <laughs> I, got you... caught, I got caught five times today not wearing my face mask. And I, I am rebelling against my boss, and I'm trying to show him how ludicrous it is. And I'm pointing out how many people died of alcohol poisoning last year, how many it's people true. died of heart disease last year. And I'm trying to explain to him that even though he, he works for the city, so he is a government employee, and he absolutely loves using the word pandemic. I told him, if you use the word pandemic around me one more time. <laughs> right? He needs a slap. <laughs> yeah, he loves it. He absolutely loves cool. it. And, and I feel like that's what the government is doing. They're, they're loving this power. They really oh, yeah. do. They really oh, do. Yeah. And Chris, I'm sure you're really feeling it. We, hey, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, it's like we have a flu outbreak like a couple of times every year, and it seems like more people die from that than the people that have died from this coronavirus. Well, here's yet, the, thing. the country never shuts down like it has to, with this. They now, do. Here's uh, the thing, though, guys. Here's the thing about the numbers. Is, the figures I'm don't so lie, but liars you. figure. That's, that's the pro And I think everybody has been fed this narrative so long that uh, CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, I don't care which side of the spectrum you're on, we've been told for the last four, five, six years, well, what they're saying is a lie. They're selling a, an advertising because of, uh, they're, they're selling advertising, they're making money, it's a for-profit entertainment. Now, all of a sudden, nobody believes the shit. And they're still portraying these numbers in front of us. And figures don't lie, but liars figure. And it's done, and, they, and they'll... They'll manipulate those numbers. They'll make them look the way they need to so they can sell their advertising for the best price. And people believe it. People buy into it hook, line, and sinker. But what's your alternative? What am I supposed to believe? What am I supposed to use for information? Can I go only on anecdotal information? So you got to rise above all of that. you got to come up with an idea that supersedes all of the stuff that we've been taught and what we watch and what we think and the only thing that does that is loving each other. Well, I really don't care what the risk is. This person is with me, and I'm not, you're not going to stop me. So that's the only thing, man. That's the most powerful. I'm, the more I look at it, the more I'm convinced that the web of weird, the connectedness of all things, lagoos, all of it, that the energy that everybody wants to talk about energy has got to be manifested as love. And I know that's so fucking gay sounding. And I understand that. I really do. I get it, man. Coming from somebody like me. But what else could it be? Do we have what it takes as a generation, as a spirituality, as a, as a movement to heal some of, the, some of this stuff that's so crippling, the thought processes, the emotional state of all of these people that we care about? I mean, look at Generation X. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I know that are Gen X that, that live, have lived in an emotional void because 
we never really had the tools necessary to build some of that shit that we see other people so care, so so thoroughly enjoy. Now all of a sudden we're beginning to figure that out with each other. Now all of a sudden we're beginning to look at it and think, hey, some of this shit I've been told ain't quite right. I gotta take a look at this, you know? And uh, it's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to become something better. And just about the time we do it, everybody gets sick. Well, not everybody, but enough that we're gonna take some of those rights from you. What? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, don't underestimate them Gen Xers. And there's a, <laughs> I was talking to a friend today, there's another generation behind that that's got a really macabre sense of humor. They're not going to buy into it either. Um, you know, it's just, it's real. There's just so much change, so much energy, so much. It's all so radical, so new, so uncertain. We don't really know where to go. And we got to find some kind of rock bottom, rock solid foundation to move forward from. And there's a lot of us that are grasping at straws right now. Holy shit, man. What do I do? That idea of courage doesn't count right now. You know, I, I want a different apocalypse. I was expecting to go out with a spear and sword, maybe an M16. You know, come on, this is bullshit. <laughs> right? Man, I was waiting for a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, come on, man. At least aliens or some shit. A, a disease? <laughs> Please make this it more interesting. Of the worlds? Fucking bastards. Give us something real. And you know what? I did hey, that's my concern Brian. is that we're all thinking it, and that might be what happens. <laughs> No, we just gave fuel to the globalists. That's all we did. That's <laughs> everyone, who's uh. everyone who's following these laws just gave fuel to the globalist groups. Uh, I heard the director of the World Health Organization say that they were going to start coming into people's homes and removing children that are at risk. Bullshit. <laughs> must try that shit, yeah. Oh, oh, let him try. Eye about it. Nobody let them try to come into my home. Yeah, I mean, shit, if you're going to die, you're going to die. The scan of your yeah, life was going to come into time my ago, own. baby. I got an <laughs> axe waiting for him then. <laughs> Damn right. Oh, fuck it. Let's go try it. Yeah. I don't even uh, open my door for them to come and test us at home. I chased them right. away. Hell yeah, man. It's worth a Jehovah's Witness. Hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, this, I'm not taking this yeah. um, story. Ryan, this people is going to hate me for this, but earlier. I do not take this virus seriously. You know, there's a lot of people that can't because it's not getting everybody. There's a bunch of us walking around. I see, I see you go. Just a second, Ron. I see a lot of people walking around. They don't have any symptoms at all. Hell, I had a headache and a sore throat for a couple of days. That might have been it. No, I me. got the normal flu who was sitting here. I just got a, a normal flu. Uh, First it was but, don't smoke, and then it was smoke, and maybe if you smoke a menthol, I've always said you smoke a menthol, a little clear that sinus infection right up. Well, cigarettes is say, actually Rob? illegal in South Africa right now. Oh, shit. We're not allowed to buy cigarettes at all. Oh my gosh. Uh, That's so, uh, and I believe, and I think, well, I believe they're going to try to keep this law after this corona bullshit. They're going to try to keep that law intact because the health department is fighting against tobacco for the last 25 years in South Africa. And they got the green light to shut down the tobacco. So it's illegal in South Africa. God and dang. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're too far away for me to back you up, buddy. <laughs> I got some friends that are uh, Rhodesian veterans over here. They might, maybe we'll come back. <laughs> but as long as I got my suppliers, Right. What was you going to but say, no, Ron? Um, no joke. Um, our, it is illegal in South Africa. Alcohol is completely illegal and tobacco. Golly. Um, so. That's insane to me. I can't even begin to imagine that. Well, I'm not a drinker, but and I make my own meat, but the French of uh, no alcohol, no cigarettes in this time. You know, Tony, you're right. They will surprise and overpay your home. They they raid effectively. I know exactly how it works because the SWAT team came to my house. I know what it looks like. The motherfuckers, I turned around. They said, they said, turn around slowly, put your hands above your head. And I had seven of of the finest of the SWAT team pointing their firearms at me. Yeah, they could just walk right up the sidewalk in the dark. I had no idea they were coming. But that um, you gotta wonder, man. At what point, Tony? I mean, it's like anything else. Sometimes 
if they came in to take your sons, there's going to be a tussle. I know for a fact at your home there would be. And there's 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 a lot to it. That's scary to think about. It is scary to think about. It is scary to think about. And we're Honestly. edging closer and closer to the 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 real built-in belief from these individuals that are enacting all of these laws that well I can it's okay I can really do this because of the public safety. No, it's, it's not about public safety. It's about fleecing the public of a fine to pay the interest on those municipal bonds to maintain a AAA credit rating for Moody's. I know exactly how it works. I was in, I worked yeah, in the market industry in 1987. I know exactly what they're doing. Oh, what's putting more fear up me right now is like I told you earlier, um, they shut down our neighborhood watches and farm watches in South Africa. Yeah, not shutting, down that, to. shutting down that farm watch that, that you know damn well there's a reason for that. Um, yeah, not I'm not going to go into that on here. That's bad. Yeah, that is opening a lot of questions for us at the moment. Who is fighting against our government and always uh, showing finger towards the government being behind these farm attacks and for them now to shut down farm watches in this time when we actually need them the most is actually raising a lot of questions towards our government. I'll tell you what, man, it's, you guys are really being backed into a corner over there as a minority. And, uh, and I, I really wish the best for you. I really do. But I, this is the kind of thing that really would set a country that's at such tension like South Africa, it would really be a problem. Shutting down that farm watch, man, that's just too violent, man. That's just the, the violence of those farm attacks is beyond. That's it's, yeah, it's a, a bit, um, it's a lot more violent than a normal house break in, um, where they shot the father or something. This is literally brutality that goes into farm attacks. Torture. Yeah, that's the deal. It's not so that it's, they're going to shoot you. It's, we've been fighting now for years against it, but um, well, it's getting probably going to have to continue. On the farms. I don't think you have an option, Chris. I don't think I don't think our people have an option other than to other than to fight. But who's going to support you? Russia might. I don't think the United States has the balls to get involved in it. But Africa Command is a. They're, they're, they're still tied up with Somalia and parts of Kenya and the terrorism in North Africa. They're out of Italy. They're still a long way from you. Now you have China buying up Zimbabwe and, and becoming a big investor there. I mean, you're, you're really fighting against a, a real viral form of race-based communism. And that's exactly what it is. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to put you in a corner. And I, I hate to say it, but it's, 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 too much of a reality it's so far away that it's very difficult for people in the northern hemisphere to wrap their heads around what's really going on you know and it's a it's the savagery of it is astounding i mean the shit happens here but it never makes the news i mean you countercultures know about it some of the other stuff but it, you know that you're probably right katie i mean okay that's it's not it's not too far over, over, overblown to think that the situation in South Africa is what they want everywhere. It'd be real, see, that's the problem. And I hate to be this way. I'm gonna play devil's advocate for just a minute. And Chris, just bear with me because if we buy into that rabbit hole, if we dive into that, in the condition that we're in mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, we really run the risk of losing that foundation because of righteous indignation. And it's, and it's a real hard balance to maintain. As a Gothi, I have that responsibility to try to keep that on an even keel, to keep that level-headed. But when do we call for action? When do we stand up and say, that's enough? What does that look like? I mean, I posted it the other day. It, you, I mean, I did seven years in the infantry. I know what they're capable of. I went through special forces assessment and selection. I know what they can do. I've flown in those C-130s. I know the effects of Puff the Magic Dragon and an A-10 Warthog. 
AT Warhol or a, a Puff the Magic Dragon or an F-16 or hell, even the Air, from the Air National Guard, four planes at the airport can level a city and they won't think twice about it. Are these fucking drones? I saw an AWACS the other day fly overhead and had four drones under its control. We, we literally have airborne aircraft carriers now. And AWACS can control, I don't know how many drones all together, but that's a terrifying thought. We have a real, um, you know, and you, you, we would like to rise up and fight it and all that other stuff, but sometimes if we don't build these bonds of love and affection and caring for each other, it's just too shallow to expect someone to die on your behalf because you hate something. It just won't work. I just, I don't work, but it, it won't work. I think that's the biggest problem in the world at the moment is the hate towards anyone. Um, you should not hate. Um, hate is a very strong word, a word for me. Uh, but you don't, you must not get um, caught down with your pants down. You're exactly uh, right. The Lord, the Lord teaches us to protect your family, to protect your ground, um, your belongings. And if each and everyone keeps to that and they don't get caught with their pants down, we can all survive. Um, like Kate said earlier, she thinks that this, the world focus is try to eliminate, let's say, the white folk all over the world. But if you're going to turn it out of cheek the whole time, then yes, it's going to happen. But if you are awake the whole time and you keep to your wits, make sure that your property and your house is safe and your family knows what to do in a suit the crisis comes up, you have nothing to fear. Um, but just be valiant. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons I've kind of tried to cultivate a healthy understanding of what it means to die. We don't, we're still struggling with that. We're still struggling with what it means to pass on. We're still trying to build bonds of, of love and affection for each other without sticking around because of some shallower form of association. We're failing to cultivate bonds of love for each other, but we're also still don't have a healthy understanding as our ancestors did of what it means to pass on, of what it means to, to die, what that transition, what that birth means. And it's a, it's a real powerful moment. You know, we don't know what it means on the other side. Some of what we've been given is, is so corrupted by Christian ideas that we, we're still trying to foist a monotheistic idea on it. Well, it's bad. He died alone. Um, it's, a, it's a scary thought, and we don't have that healthy understanding of it yet. I think it's something we need to, we need to focus on. But how do you do that without really coming out as, a, as, a, as a, one of these people that looks like an edgelord that wants to talk about human sacrifice. We need to reenact human sacrifice and just dumb shit like that. Listen, that we have a long way to go, but I'm, my point kind of all of that is that we're at that point in time in history where if we're to become anything more than a footnote, it is, it is now, it is now to really start building those bonds, you know, I, you know, and realize I'm not that important. There are other people in this world that I might talk to, that I might inspire that, my gosh, they might go on to be something truly unique to go down in the books of history. It's not my place to stop that because I think they're going to do better than me. And I think we've got to get out of that mindset a little bit. Rowan, I know you've got your hand up. What would you want to say, man? <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier about it's like people who try to make their mark in the world by putting other people down. It's like, you don't make your mark on the world that way. You make your mark sure. by leaving the world a little bit better than you came into it. That's a real good point. That idea of leaving the world you know, a little bit better than you. You do something to build up your community. and. One of the things Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, pointed out in his, some of his exceptional work 
was that whenever a community settled into an area, the first thing they did was integrate themselves into the environment in which they lived. And it became their interaction with the environment in which they lived became a real expression of their ideas of what was holy. And we, we live in a world that really was, was more than ready to sacrifice that to live in a city for the almighty dollar. And now all of a sudden we're, we're, we see this great movement of people that are wanting to return to the land. And technology is at a point where it no longer means roughing it. It means you can have, you know, you can have satellite TV and internet and electricity and running water and all that stuff with just a little bit of outlay of cash and be entirely independent from whatever nearby community you happen to reside by. But we're, it's still yeah. so uncertain. We, Next thing you know, we'll be having robots that can wipe our asses for us. I don't want no robot touching my ass. You'll be surprised it's already too right late to doing that. Robot comes near my ass, I'm gonna have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> you get my point though i do get your point oh, i do it's comfort the ideas of comfort are a real or a real sinister thing um if i can be comfortable it'll be okay if i can be comfortable i won't have to uh well i won't have to change very much will i i won't have to grow i won't have to physically develop um, that <laughs> I won't, you know, there's a, what's that cartoon Wally? Remember that cartoon Wally where all the humans got on the big cruise ship and that was in outer space and they all just kind of rode, yeah. rode around on chairs and their bones all shrank up and mm -hmm. you no, know, <laughs> it's not far from the truth of what's happening. It's not far from the truth of what we're dealing with. Well, it's like at one point does striving for comfort become laziness and it's, we're already there but things we're just already stagnate. there yeah yeah and we need to work ourselves out of that i mean i'm all for being comfortable but you know it's like i'm not letting a robot do something for me that i can do for myself i agree but we that's part of what i've been talking about with industriousness, self-reliance, and, um, and perseverance. Um, for us to effectively stand against some of these things, we've got to quit relying on other people to provide for the, the comfort of our home, the actual sustenance that we live in. I mean, everybody's hugely inconvenienced because Walmart's not open 24 hours or more. If we had a bunch of canned goods, I, dude, I got right here, I got like four or five grocery bags of, of food and there's a shelf over there full of food and water and rice and all. I mean, I have all that stuff. And, you know, usually I grow a garden. I got a, a compost pile out back and I just, you know, we're, um, we've been seduced by a real easy life. And there's, and there's some men that have had to face hard times and we, we got a, our whole, our whole mindset has got to rise beyond that. We always want a woman that can kind of hang with you and all that stuff, but that might not be her role. It might be an entirely different thing to do. Um, who knows? I, I, who knows? But yeah, you're right. Comfort is a real seductive bitch. And it's like you got this whole generation of millennials that rely so much on technology. Like you got this whole generation of millennials that are practically born with a cell phone in their hand and can't imagine life without a cell phone or a type or a tablet or a laptop or something, you know, it's like, you ask them to try to go grow a garden. It's like, they won't have a damn clue. It's true. But the information is readily available. I think that's uh, Ann Sue's. I think we, like I've said before, we, we lost a, we lost a great benefit when the greatest generation largely passed without passing on that knowledge of some of the things they learned during the great depression to our generation. And uh, now we're, we're faced with it again. And, you know, quite frankly, the only thing that'll bring an economy out of, of some shit that's as bad as we're facing right now is a really good war. You know, we might throw one and everybody comes this time and that's usually how it works. So that might be what we're facing. And, uh, I don't want, um, it's, it's, we need a place where men can prove that they're men again. 
than have the courage to love. And I think uh, it's such a vague and nebulous threat we're facing now. We find ourselves confused and unsure of what kind of enemy we should face, what kind of attitude we should adopt, what kind of approach we might take given the, given the very vague and nebulous threat we've been told we're facing. Um, how do you fight against that? How do you stand up against that and maintain some aspect of dignity, dignity and decency? Um, we, that's kind of the whole thing with, with everything we're dealing with is, is are we all cowards now? Well, I expected a, a world war or a war be, before this pandemic because in history, before every pandemic, there was a war. Coming yeah, on. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there was a war before every pandemic hit the world. So I was expecting a, a war before this one. I'm hey, surprised it happens other way around this time. Well, World War II brought us out of the Great Depression. I mean, everybody made money on that bastard. Uh, you know, Hitler, yeah. got, Hitler got his factories working, and and he told them to produce, and he, you know, they made him Time Magazine Man of the Year in what thirty eight or thirty nine, and you know he. He got the factories working again. Um, what he failed to consider was that all of the stuff they were producing wasn't being bought. So we had to figure out a way to, to cover that up, to figure that out. Well, you know, here's a justifiable reason. Let's, let's get a large expenditure going. And it just kind of snowballed from there. <laughs> but we're, we're kind of facing that right now. There's a lot of facilities that are shuttered right now that produce products that we count on. And um, I just hope they don't shut down the toilet paper factories. I got two of them around me and uh, <laughs> I still see steam pump on them. I went to the store tonight and uh, that shelf was entirely bare. Even the paper towels are gone. People, there's gonna be some chapped asses running around here using them paper towels. I'm just saying, you know, good night, buddy. Just take a shower. You know that kind of stuff. So never mind. That was big. That was big to go downhill quick, guys. I'm just telling you. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate everybody's sure. time. We've been on here a good while, and uh, <laughs> we got. That uh, was a pleasure being here. Yeah? It was. Yeah, I'm was glad you first joined time in. Definitely not be the last time. I, excellent. I look forward to seeing you, bud. And. Uh, Mm. Shit, tomorrow's Monday, and I have to go to work, and I plan on grabbing life by the nose and whipping his ass. So I hope all y'all. Thank you, Brian. Good. Thank you. Y'all have a good, have a good day tomorrow. Hell, you. Thanks, Brian. Well, all right, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for the evening. I appreciate. Well, we sure it. do appreciate you, Brian. Hey, I appreciate y'all. Y'all make my day. I get to go into the world. Think I did. Wrong. <laughs> right, right. All right, y'all take care. Wrong. Be safe Thank out you. there, man. All right, bye. Bye.